He moved close to the boy, inches at a time. Finally, he slid his hand through the waves of thick, blonde hair. Benjamin jumped. He actually shivered and shook uncontrollably. That was nice. It's all right to be afraid, Potter whispered. There's a strange joy to be found in fear. Trust me on that, Benjamin. I've been there. I know exactly what you're feeling now. Potter could barely stand it. This was just too much of a great thing, a dream come true. He had been denied this forbidden pleasure, and now here was this absolutely perfect, beautiful, stunning young man. What was this? Benjamin was trying to speak through his gag. Potter wanted to hear the boy's sweet voice, to see his luscious mouth move, to look into his eyes. He bent forward and kissed the gag over the boy's mouth. He actually felt Benjamin's lips underneath their softness. Then Mr. Potter couldn't stand it for one second more. His fingers fumbling, incoherent whispers seeping from his mouth, his body shaking as if he had palsy. He removed the blindfold and looked into Benjamin's eyes. May I call you Benji? He whispered. Chapter 31 Another of the captives, Audrey Meek, watched her obscene, deviant, possibly insane captor as he calmly and coolly fixed her breakfast. She was bound by rope, loosely, but she couldn't run. She couldn't believe any of this was happening, had happened, and presumably would continue happening. She was being held in a nicely furnished cabin somewhere, who knew where, and she was still flashing back to the incredible moment when she had been grabbed at the King of Prussia Mall, when they had yanked her away from Sarah and Andrew. Dear God, were the children all right? My children, Audrey asked again. I have to know for sure they're all right. I want to talk to them. I won't do anything you ask until I speak to them, not even eat. An uncomfortable, silent moment passed, and then the art director chose to speak. Your children are just fine. That's all I'll tell you, he said. You should eat. How can you know my children are all right, she sniffed. You can't. Audrey, you're in no position to make demands. Not anymore. That life is behind you. He was tall, maybe six foot two, and well-built, with a bushy black beard and flashing blue eyes that seemed intelligent to her. She guessed that he was around fifty. He told her to call him Art Director. No reason for the name. Not yet, anyway. Nor any other explanation for what had happened so far. I was concerned myself, so I called your house. The children are there, with your nanny and husband. I promise. I wouldn't lie to you, Audrey. I'm different from you in that respect. Aubrey shook her head. I I'm supposed to trust you? Your word? I think it would be a good idea, yes. Why not? Who else can you trust out here? Yourself, of course, and me. That's all there is. You're miles and miles away from anybody else. It's just us two. Please, get used to it. You like your scrambled eggs a little soft, right? Fluffy? Isn't that the word you use? Why are you doing this? Audrey asked, getting braver, since he hadn't actually threatened her yet. What are the two of us doing here? He sighed. All in due time, Audrey. For now, let's just say it's an unhealthy obsession. It's more complicated, actually, but let's leave it at that for now. She was surprised by the answer. He knew he was a freaking nutcase, didn't he? Was that good or bad, though, that he knew exactly what he was doing? I'd like to keep you free like this as much as possible. I don't want you kept in bondage, for God's sake. Not even the ropes. Please don't try to run away, or it won't be possible. Okay? He seemed so reasonable at times. Seemed. Christ! Wasn't this the most insane thing? Of course it was. But insane things happen all the time to people. I want to be your friend, he said as he served her breakfast. The eggs cooked just so. Twelve-grain toast, herbal tea, boysenberry jam. I've cooked all the things you like. I want to treat you like you deserve. 
You can trust me, Audrey. Start by trusting me just a little bit. Try your eggs. Fluffy. They're delish. Chapter 32 I was marking time at Quantico, and I didn't like it much. I attended my classes the next day, then an hour of fitness training. At five, I went to see what Monty Donnelly had collected so far on White Girl. She had a small cramped cubicle on the third floor of the dining hall building. On one wall was a collage of photos and photocopies of bits of evidence from brutally violent crimes, arranged in an eye-catching cubist's fantasy. I wrapped my knuckles against her metal nameplate before entering the cube. Monty turned and smiled when she saw me standing there. I noticed glossy photos of her sons, a funny portrait of Monty and the sons, and also a picture of Pierce Brosnan as a debonair, sexy James Bond. Hey, look who's back for more punishment. You can tell by the size of my digs that the Bureau doesn't realize yet that this is the information age, what Bill Clinton used to call the third way. You know the joke. The Bureau supports yesterday's technology tomorrow. Any information for me? Monty swiveled back to her computer and IBM. Let me print up a few of these choice pieces for your burgeoning collection. I know you like hard copies. Dinosaur. It's just the way I work. I had asked around about Monty and heard the same thing everywhere. She was bright, an incredibly hard worker, woefully underappreciated by the powers at Quantico. I'd also found out that Monty was a single mother of two and struggling to make ends meet. The only complaint against her was that she worked too hard, brought stuff home just about every night and weekend. Monty shuffled together a thick batch of pages for me. I could tell she was obsessive by the way she evened out all the pages. They had to be just so. Anything pop out at you? I asked. She shrugged. I'm just a researcher, right? More corroboration. Upscale white women who've been reported missing in the last year or so. The numbers are out of whack. Way too high. A lot of them are attractive blondes. Blondes do not have more fun in these instances. No particular regional skew, which I want to look into more. Geographic profiling? Sometimes it can pinpoint the exact locus of criminal activity. No obvious regional differences so far. That's too bad. Anything in terms of the victim's appearances? Any patterns at all? Monty clucked her tongue, shook her head. Nothing sticks out. There are women missing in New England, the South, out West. I'll check into it more. The women are described as very attractive, for the most part, and none of them have been found. They go missing, they stay missing. She looked at me for a few uncomfortable seconds. There was sadness in her eyes. I sensed that she wanted out of this cubicle. I reached down for the pages. We're trying. I made a promise to the Connolly family. There was a flicker of humor in her light green eyes. You keep your promises? Try, I said. Thanks for the pages. Don't work too hard. Go home and see your kids. You too, Alex. See your kids. You're working too hard already. Chapter 33 Nana and the kids, not to mention Rosie the cat, were lying in wait for me on the front porch when I got home that night. Their cranky body language and the sullen looks on their faces weren't good signs. I figured I knew why everybody was so happy to see me. You always keep your promises? 7.30. It's getting later and later, Nana said, and shook her head. You mentioned we might go see Drumline at the movies. Damon was excited. It's orientation, I told her. Exactly, Nana said and the frown on her face deepened. Wait until the real stuff starts up. You'll be coming home at midnight again, if at all. You have no life. You have no love life. All those women who like you, Alex, though God knows why, let one of them catch you. Let somebody in before it's too late. Maybe it's too late already. Wouldn't surprise me. You're tough, I said. 
and plopped down on the porch steps next to the kids. Your Nana is tough as nails, I said to them. Still light out. Anybody want to play hoops? Damon frowned and shook his head. Not with Janny. No way that's going to happen. Not with the big superstar Damon, Janny smirked. Even though Diana Taurasi could kick his butt at O-U-T. I got up and headed inside. I'll get the ball. We'll play O-U-T. When we returned from the park, Nana had already put little Alex to bed. She was back sitting on the porch. I brought a pint of pralines and cream and a pint of Oreos and cream. We ate. Then the kids wandered up to their rooms to sleep or study or mess around on the Internet. You're becoming hopeless, Alex, Nana pronounced, as she sucked the last ice cream off her spoon. That's all I can say to you. You mean consistent and dedicated. That's getting harder to find. You like that Oreos and cream, don't you? She rolled her eyes. Maybe you ought to catch up with the time, son. Duty isn't everything anymore. I'm here for the kids, and even for you, old woman. Never said you weren't. Well, not lately, anyway. How's Jamila? We've both been busy. Nana nodded her head up and down, up and down like one of those dolls that people keep on the dashboards of their automobiles. Then she pushed herself up and started to gather the ice cream dishes the kids had left around the porch. I'll get those, I told her. Kids should get them. They know better, too. They take advantage when I'm around. Right. Because they know you feel guilty. For what? I asked. What did I do? What am I missing here? Now that is the main question you have to answer, isn't it? I'm going into bed. Good night, Alex. I love you, and I do like Oreos and cream. Then she muttered, Hopeless. Am not, I said to her back. Are too. She spoke without turning. She always got the last word. I eventually moseyed up to my office in the attic and made a phone call I'd been dreading. But I'd made a promise. The phone rang, and then I heard a man's voice say, Brandon Connolly. Hello, Judge Connolly. This is Alex Cross, I said. I heard him sigh. But he said nothing, so I continued. I don't have any specific good news about Mrs. Connolly yet. We have over 50 agents active in the Atlanta area, though. I'm calling because I told you I'd keep in touch and to reassure you that we're working. Because I made a promise. Chapter 34 Something about the abductions wasn't tracking for me. The early kidnappings had been committed carefully. Then suddenly the abductors began to get sloppy. The pattern was inconsistent. Why? What did it mean? What had changed? If I could figure that out, we might have a break. The next morning, I got to Quantico about five minutes before the director touched down in a big black bell helicopter. The news that Burns was on the ground circulated quickly. Maybe Monty Donnelly was right about one thing. This was the information age, even inside the Bureau, even at Quantico. Burns had ordered an emergency meeting, and I was informed that I was to come. Maybe I was back on the case? The director acknowledged a couple of agents when he entered the conference room in the admin building. His eyes never made contact with mine, though, and once again I wondered what he was doing here. Did he have news for us? What kind of news would warrant a visit from him? He sat in the first row as the behavioral analysis unit chief, Dr. Bill Thompson, walked to the front of the room. It was becoming clear that Burns was here as an observer. But why? What did he want to observe? An administrative assistant to Dr. Thompson passed out stapled documents. At the same time, the first slide of a PowerPoint presentation was projected on a wall screen. There's been another kidnapping, Thompson announced to the group. It occurred Saturday night in Newport, Rhode Island. There's been a sea change here. The victim was male. To our knowledge, he's the first male they've taken. Dr. Thompson gave us the details which were also projected on the wall screen. 